Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Bible study. This is our last in a series of how to be a friend of God. So we're going to try to wrap things up. In fact, we're going to look at a few siblings tonight. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus are the topic for the evening. And so we're going to be discussing uh, some events that happened in their life and try to pinpoint some examples for us, things that we can see and put into practice in our life that they experienced in becoming a friend of God. And so we're going to take a look at that tonight. But before we begin, let's ask God's blessing on the study. Okay, if you bow your heads. Great loving Heavenly Father, God Almighty, thanks so much for your wonderful blessings. What a wonderful thing it is to understand your truth. So we certainly thank you for opening our minds to understanding your way and your plan and your purpose for life. What a blessing it is, God, and we thank you for that, and we certainly don't take that for granted. We pray and ask God that you give us insight tonight. Help us to dig a little bit deeper tonight so that we can understand more fully what it means to be your friend and how we can better become friends with you and Jesus Christ. So, Father, we pray for your inspiration, your guidance, and, and certainly your inspiration that we would understand what you're teaching us. And so, Father, we put it into your hands and we pray all of this and ask it by the authority of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, as I mentioned, this is the last in our series. Mary, Martha, Lazarus, they're pretty familiar figures. I think everybody knows maybe just a little bit about them. Uh, but sometimes I think knowing a little bit of their story in a way can maybe short circuit some of our understanding. Because they're, they're well known, uh, we may miss some of the details in parts of their stories. In a way, we sometimes polarize them and, and put them in a little box, and, and we say, well, that's what they're all about. And sometimes those caricatures might take away some of the real picture of the kind of individuals they are. So if you heard the name Martha, or maybe better said, Martha, Martha, does something already come to mind when you have those words spoken? Uh, maybe that's not always the best. Maybe that's not necessarily who she was all, what, what she was all about. So what I thought might be helpful is to dig down into their stories a little bit and see if we can get a little bit more accurate view of these sisters and brother, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. What was it that made them friends with Jesus Christ? What was their relationship like? We're going to dig into that and try to get a clear picture of who they were and how they related with Christ himself. So let's do that. Now, when you think of uh, Mary, Martha, uh, they're actually pretty prominent ladies in the Gospels. So they're mentioned quite a few times. They're mentioned in each one of the Gospels. So uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all of them mention Mary and Martha. But there's something odd about them. The fact that they don't mention any husbands for either one of them. They don't mention a father for either one of them. And so that's unusual for a, a woman in the Bible, that there's no other connections except to their brother Lazarus that is really specific and really obvious in Scripture. So as we think about them, pretty unusual for a woman not to be married that's used in the Scripture. So what does that tell us about her, or about Mary, about Martha? Well, either they were very young women, which could be a possibility. Uh, were they orphaned, maybe? That seems to be a possibility. Or were they young enough not to be married as yet? That's at least one category. There are others that, as they look at this particular story uh, of the sisters, they, they wonder if, well, maybe they're older. Maybe they're on the other extreme. Maybe they're older widows who were married at one time and yet now have lost their husbands. And so which side of the equation are they on? Well, we don't really know. It's possible either one, either one. And it's even possible that in their uh, enthusiasm to follow God, that they had chosen to be single. Uh, so those different stories seem to impact the ladies. Uh, and where they lived was also an impact on who they were. Uh, they lived in Bethany. Uh, the brothers, brother and sister all lived there. And Bethany is an interesting place. Uh, there was no doubt 
a group of Essenes that lived there. And the Essenes were a, a sect that were very aesthetic. They were strict and held their beliefs you know, very closely. They wanted to make sure they kept what was given to them truthfully. And so they, they seemed to be related to that group that took care of the Dead Sea Scrolls. They were Essene as well. And so the town itself may have something to do with the story and the stories that we find in the Bible. Uh, Bethany seems to have had a hospice there or some type of a, a place that took care of sick people, took care of those who were injured, took care of those, uh, even some of the stories say, ritually unclean. Those that may have been lepers as well could have gone to Bethany, it seems, and been taken care of there uh, at a hospice that Bethany was known for. And so it's possible that Mary and Martha and maybe even Lazarus had something to do with taking care of those who were sick. And we'll see how that comes into play as we, we kind of rehearse their stories. Those who were sick, those who were destitute, those that, that needed help. And in fact, if you looked into this word Essene that came to represent their group, it seems to be related uh, to the Hebrew word for healers. Healers has a connection to the Essenes. And so Bethany seems to be that kind of a place where there was a hospice or a home, a place for those that were hurting, those that were in need, those that were not only destitute, but those were sick as well. So that comes into play with Mary and Martha especially. Now, we look at the Bible. Hard to tell how old they are, like we mentioned, their marital status. Uh, seems that most women at this time were married by the time, well, guess how old they were by the time they got married, usually. About 16, you're getting pretty old, getting to be a, uh, an old lady if you weren't married by the time you were about 16 or so. So society was a little bit different uh, during the first century. Uh, it's also interesting as we look at the stories, normally Martha's mentioned first, which may or may not tell us much. Mary gets in there once in a while, but Martha usually mentioned first, which may seem to point us uh, to the fact that she was probably the older sister. Uh, and then there's Lazarus, who seems to perhaps be much younger than the other two, which may tie into the fact that there was much wailing, much sorrow when Lazarus died. You know, was his death something that was really unexpected? And being a young man, even that much more unexpected. So that may play into the, uh, the whole scenario, especially as maybe no parents around, no husbands around, that the grieving uh, might have been that much more. Maybe they lost their parents uh, at a young age, and then to lose a brother, as we'll find out, just adds to the, the grief that they experience. So those are possibilities when we see, see them as individuals in the Bible. Now, it's also interesting, even with their circumstances, they seem to be pretty wealthy. They seem pretty well off. They seem to have a home. So single women to have homes was pretty unusual at this. It wasn't unheard of. It wasn't, you know, rare, but definitely unusual for women to be in this position. Uh, we know from one of the stories that uh, Mary had very, very expensive perfume. Now, how did she come to own that? Was, was it just the fact that they were, were very rich? Uh, very possible, very possible. Uh, normally, widows would be in that position to have a home, uh, maybe leaders in the community in that way. Uh, that isn't unusual in the Bible. In fact, we read the story of, of Christ preaching and teaching, and uh, those that supported him were oftentimes women. Uh, there's a story over in Acts, or not Acts, in the book of Luke. We want to turn over to the book of Luke for just a moment. We can see the example of women who supported the ministry of Christ. Take a look at Acts chapter 8. And in verse 2, we can see a number of women that were involved in the ministry of Jesus Christ. Right at the very beginning of chapter 8, it says, it came to pass that he, this is Christ, went through every city and village preaching and bringing the glad tidings, the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. 
But we see it wasn't just the twelve. It says certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons. Joanna, the wife of Chusa. Herod's steward and Susanna and many others provided for him from their substance. So this is Luke chapter 8, talking about those ladies who supported the ministry, out of Christ, uh, uh, ministry of Christ. And how did they do that? Well, they did it out of their own means because they seemed to have the resources to be able to support Christ and the Twelve as well. And so this seems to point to the fact that Mary and Martha were probably homeowners uh, who at that time would have been fairly well off. Now living in Bethany also gives us some insight into their uh, background as well. Uh, Bethany means the house of something. It seems that it can lead a couple of ways. Beth meaning house, Bethany seems to tie into house of misery or maybe house of the poor, which may be part of the uh, name that connects to this hospice or this home where they would take care of the sick and the destitute. Uh, others argue, well, it doesn't mean that at all. Some will say, well, it actually means uh, the house of figs, that it has to do with olives and figs, and, uh, or the dates is the other uh, aspect of that, the house of dates. And of course, uh, that area of the country was was pretty famous for the fruits and you know those kinds of things that uh, that were available in the area so that's that's a possibility as well and the fact that as we get to this section of scripture that we'll go over tonight uh, this was an important place for Jesus Christ not only did Mary Martha and Lazarus live there but Christ spent a considerable amount of time uh, in Bethany itself it was Bethany where he began that ride into Jerusalem where he rode on that uh, colt of a donkey. That started in Bethany. Uh, Bethany was the place uh, that he basically spent that uh, week before the crucifixion. He was there in Bethany the last few days uh, just before the crucifixion. He was in Bethany. And uh, after the crucifixion, it was near Bethany that Christ ascended into heaven. So a, a pretty important place. Uh, that impacted the ministry of Christ and his relationship uh, to these ladies. So as we launch into the study, I thought it would be helpful to look at some specific events in the three uh, siblings' lives. And first of all, I want to start over in Luke chapter 10 and look at a couple of instances. We're going to start out with a visit from Christ. That's the first event we'll look at. So let's take a look at Luke chapter 10 and notice this visit uh, from Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village. Well, he is Christ. What village is he entering? It's Bethany. A certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. So we see it's Martha's house, especially here in Luke 10. But it says Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away. Now, most of us have probably heard this little bit of story about Christ visiting uh, the home there, the circumstances of him teaching. And then we see Martha, Martha doing these many things. Now, that shouldn't be that unusual because for a, a woman at this time, boy, one of the chief responsibilities they had was hospitality. They were to be hospitable. They were to serve the meal. In fact, in this society at that day, th this was a, a very important job. This was almost a sacred duty for the women to take care of the hospitality and welcoming people into their home. Of course, uh, Mary sitting at Christ's feet, well, that's, that's a normal kind of a position to be in for a disciple that's being taught. Now, here's a question. Was Martha doing evil things that she had to be reprimanded by Christ? Well, no. In fact, 
what was she doing? She was doing good things, wasn't she? She was serving. She was giving. She was helping. She was feeding everyone. She was watching over the family. She was taking care of the guests. I don't think any of us would put that in the category of doing bad things. So she was doing good. But oftentimes when we think of Martha, we think of, oh, yeah, she's just way off track. Yet she was doing good things. Now, what was the problem, though? And what was Christ focusing on here? Well, it says that she was distracted. She was distracted. So we could say she was well, maybe overoccupied. She was a little too busy. She was drawn away, even though she was doing a good thing. Even though she was doing what we could say was right, it wasn't the best. She was doing the expected thing. Everybody expected her to be a good hostess. And yet, Jesus points out the fact, not that she was some kind of an evil person, but she wasn't choosing to do the most important thing. Yes, to take care of the guests. Yes, to feed them. Yes, to do all of those things, but put it, to, put it in its place and then put first things first. And so he points out the fact that Mary, her sister, chose the best. She chose the best to be with Christ, to learn from Him, to set those things aside for a minute. Because we're not told the whole story here. You know, maybe it was, was Martha and Mary both getting things prepared, and then the guests arrive, and then Christ began teaching, and that's where, you know, Mary sat down and started to listen, and Martha was still taking care of the dishes and the dessert and all the other things. I and mean, we're not really told the whole story. But Martha, at some point, Christ says, chose what was most important, chose what was most profitable. I think that's a, a wonderful lesson for us. Wonderful lesson from this is that we, we've got to be sure that in this instance, we've got to put God first. We've got to put Christ first. If we're going to be a friend of God, we've got to make sure in whatever the instance is that we put God first. I am always amazed by this story to think that Martha did good things. But sometimes good things is not what God's after. Is it the best? Well, we could say, was she doing sinful things? Well, it doesn't say she's sinning, but she just didn't choose what was best. And sometimes I think we find ourselves in that kind of a position in our life. You know, it might be okay. I mean, this isn't blatant sin or anything like that. But do we really hold ourselves accountable to do the best? Martha needed to order her life with God first, first, foremost. And certainly that's a reminder for all of us. That's what, that's what we need to do. Is, is God really there at our heart and our core? And so it really gets down to the fact that it's not that God's word means a lot to me, because it should, and there's no doubt about that. It doesn't mean that, boy, I would like fulfillment from, you know, understanding God's way. What really I think Christ is pointing at here is that God is our meaning. And that's a little bit different than just saying God is meaningful to me. No, that's, that, that's okay, <laughs> but it's not the best. The best is to understand God is our life. God is our meaning. God is what fulfills us. Not that it's just this nice little section of my life. And so this story certainly helps us to frame our life in that way. And I, I think in ways today, it's even that much more important for us because there can be so many distractions and we can get taken so far off course and we can become so busy. And those things that distract us or keep us busy or we find ourselves kind of engulfed in may not be blatantly evil. In fact, they might be good, but because we get drawn away, it's not the best. It's not the best. So. Imagine the things in this world. Imagine the things in the world that we count as important. How lasting are they? How lasting are those things? Think about your car. <laughs> well, my car is really valuable. I need it to get around. Well, am I going to take it with me? No, it's not going to last. Our houses aren't going to last. You know, so many things in our life, they're temporary. 
They're here, they're done, it's over. But see, Christ points out the fact there are things that cannot be taken away. You see, too often times we find ourselves holding on to those things or desiring those things, wanting those things that don't last and won't last and can't last. And here's Christ pointing out, Mary's chosen the things that cannot be taken away. Boy, isn't that the kind of choice that we want to make? We want to make that choice that uh, certainly if we put God at our heart and core and he is our meaning, never going to be taken away. That cannot be taken away from us. So I think that's an amazing lesson that we can learn from this section in the, in the book of Luke. All right, let's flip over and look at a second, a second aspect. We, we looked at Jesus' visit. Uh, let's jump over to Lazarus and his situation. He starts out this section in a pretty dire strait. Well, more than dire, he's dead. <laughs> John chapter 11. If you want to go over to John chapter 11. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about this story is because of the, the scenario, the, the fantastic miracle of Lazarus being resurrected back to physical life kind of overshadows some of the story that we can understand the point that, all right, Lazarus is going to be resurrected. This is a phenomenal miracle. He comes back to physical life. But there's parts of the story that sometimes get overshadowed because of the, the awesome nature of the miracle that happens here. So let's, let's look at John chapter 11, uh, verse 1. It says, Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. So we've got the scenario here. We're back in Bethany. They live there. Mary, this Mary is the one who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Okay, he wasn't quite dead yet. So he's still alive here as we begin. Uh, Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. All right, as we think, of, think about being a friend of God, think about these three being friends with Jesus Christ. It's interesting, we get an insight into this relationship by the message that they send to Christ. If your brother or sister were sick and you knew that there was healing power in the Savior, in Christ, and he was your good friend, but he wasn't there and you needed to send him a text or you need to email him or phone him, would you say what they said? What did they say? Did you see their message? Lord, he whom you love is sick. Or would I say, get over here now. He's going to die. Pretty interesting the way that they approached this. They didn't you know, fly off the handle. They identified Lazarus as the one Jesus loved. That's pretty amazing. Wouldn't it be great if you know, our name was there? That Jesus is the one that loves me? I mean, we know that. That's true, too. They identify Lazarus only. They didn't even, uh, even to hear it doesn't even say his name. Lord, the one you love is sick. Well, what does that emphasize? What does that remind us of? I think it helps us to realize this was a pretty close relationship that they had. This wasn't just an acquaintance. You know, this was a close, intimate relationship. Uh, and they didn't have to say more than that. They didn't have to say more because they knew that Christ would understand. Now, it's a little surprising because Christ doesn't go right away. He deliberately stays a couple more days. And so he doesn't go. And it's also interesting, then in verse 5, it says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So now we realize not that Jesus only loved Lazarus, but now we have all of them. All of them were told Jesus loved. He loved them all. So we frame this relationship in a very close friendship. And we're going to see some of the characteristics of this friendship come to light as this story plays out. 
So let's skip down. We're going to skip down a little bit over a couple little areas where the disciples are wondering, well, should we go back to Jerusalem or should we, should we leave here? What are we going to do? This could be trouble. How is this going to work out? We get through all of those kinds of things. We have Jesus coming uh, to the scene where Lazarus has already died. Verse, uh, let's go down to 17. Verse 17. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. So he's been dead a while. So Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. Many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. So they were mourning. And of course, they were crying. And uh, sometimes there were professional wailers that would be at, at uh, these kinds of funerals and, and at the tomb. Verse 20, now Martha, as soon as she had heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. So we find Martha went out to meet him. See, if we get too critical of Martha and uh, in the story of Martha, Martha and Jesus tell her to come and you know, help me. Now, where's Mary? Well, she's sitting in the house. It seems like it was known that Christ was coming, and yet Martha's the one that goes out to meet him. So we see kind of a, a little bit of a, a change uh, in perspective here. So Martha goes out, and an interesting circumstance begins to take place. What's the scene? We have the death of the brother. And what happened in society during this time, and in fact going all the way back into the Old Testament, what happened when individuals died? How was a funeral uh, scenario conducted? What happened you know, when people were in this situation? Well, mourning and lamenting, pleading with God, that was all a part of traditional things that went on at that time of death. And in fact, if you flip with me back to Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 19, it gives us a little bit of, a little bit of insight into kind of a traditional role for women during this time of, of death. So go back to Jeremiah chapter 9. Look at verse 19. Here's almost some instruction to traditionally what the ladies would do. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 19, it says, Hear you women the word of the Lord, and let your ears receive his message. Teach to your daughters this dirge, and each other this lament. Now, without taking a lot of time to delve into Jeremiah, it's pointing us to the fact that there was a tradition of lamenting those who died. And so let's think about this concept of lamenting, because this comes into play during the scenario of the sisters and the death of their brother, Lazarus. It was expected that women would lament. It was encouraged that they would lament. What, what, what was a lament anyway? Well, it was a, a prayerful plea to God. And normally, it would have a number of parts to the way that they would lament. You know, what was the scenario involved to lamenting in this traditional kind of a way? Well, normally, it was fourfold. There were four parts to a traditional lament. And that first part is kind of known as the address. All right, who are you talking to, in other words? Who are they pleading to? Where is it focused? Where is this lament focused? And the lament is, you'll find a lot of examples throughout the Bible. Uh, Hannah, during the time of uh, this, when Samuel was being born and all of that type of thing, when she was wanting to have a baby, she was lamenting during that whole scenario with Eli. And that, uh, back in 1 Samuel, you can check that out. You can look up uh, some of the Psalms. Uh, Psalm chapter 6 is a lament. The whole book of Lamentations is lamenting over Jerusalem and crying out about that. And so all of those things seem to encompass these different parts. So we have the address. Who are we talking to? We also have what you could call the complaint. What's the problem? What's the issue? Why are you crying out? Why are you pleading? What is the, 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 the issue? What happened, in other words? What happened here? Uh, and, of course, once you know who you're talking to and what happened, 
now we have to say, well, what's, what's the solution? You know, what are you saying? So we, in a way, we've got the, uh, the solution, or uh, let me see, let me spell it right, solution, there we go. You know, what, what is the issue that you would like solved? What are you petitioning God about? What is that solution? And then ultimately, it's recognizing where that solution really is. In order to solve that petition, we got to realize that it's going to be solved by God, declaring our, our faith and our confidence and trust in God. So as you keep that in mind, now what does that have to do with this section of Scripture? Let's, let's notice a couple of things. Go back here to, uh, to John chapter 11. In John chapter 11, we go back to uh, the story where Christ has come, Lazarus is dead, Martha goes out to meet him. Martha meets him, what's the first thing she does? Number one, Lord. She greets Christ and she just doesn't say Jesus, she addresses him as Lord, as Master, as King. And it begins to follow this form of a traditional lament. She gets right into the situation, into the complaint. She says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Yeah, that's the problem. That's the complaint, the death of her brother. And in fact, she is so bold to say, you're part of the, part of the problem, Christ. Isn't that what she's saying? You're part, if you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. You're part of the problem. Interesting that she points that out to him. She's holding him accountable for not being there. Now, we might step back and say, wow, what a babe in the, in the faith. You know, what, what little immature faith this woman had. You ever thought that? Well, maybe not. Maybe not so immature. This kind of bold statement is recognizing some pretty powerful things. What, what did, did she, she say? say? She, she said, said, Christ, I have no doubt. I have absolute faith you can heal my brother. So this isn't just a, a question that, oh, wow, I wonder if it would have been different if you were here. It's, it's not like that. She had no question that Christ could heal. She had absolute faith, only the fact that, well, he wasn't there to help. And so, in a way, we see she's demonstrating this boldness of faith as she complains to Christ. Well, now what are we going to do? Now what are we going to do about it? We find that we come to this, this third element. What's the solution? What am I petitioning Christ about? Well, he says, Lord, if you've been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But verse 22, notice the faith she has. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. She's saying, I know you can still heal him. I know you could do this. I know. She's expecting a miracle, it sounds like to me. And so we, we find that there's you know, recognition of her faithfulness. She's, you know, she's testimony to the fact that she does have faith in Jesus Christ. And then, of course, Christ answers this. And here we are, we're still on number three. She had petitioned Christ here. She says, Christ, I know God will give you what you ask. Jesus responds in verse 23. He says, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And then Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? So we, we start this little reply by Christ, kind of helping to straighten her out a little bit, because Martha misunderstands the resurrection. And what does Christ do? He challenges her. He challenges her to take it to the next level, to understand this whole thing on a deeper level. And what we find here is, is a pretty amazing conversation between two friends, isn't it? Amazing conversation. 
Martha is honestly, openly, boldly telling Christ what's on her heart, how she really feels. Jesus challenges her to think differently about the resurrection, to think differently about life. And then how does she respond? See, I think this is, this is the amazing part. She responds like a, like a true friend. And it takes us to this, this fourth part of what a lament is all about. Look what she says to Christ in verse 27. She says to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. So she expresses her trust, her faith, her confidence in the power of God. She identifies with Jesus Christ. She identifies with her friend. She understands her dear friend's authority and power over life and death. And so we have a remarkable uh, exhibition of her faith. And so when you think about this in terms of being a friend, being a friend of Jesus Christ, she wasn't afraid to challenge him. Why weren't you here? She wasn't afraid. She just openly, straightforwardly laid it on the line. She kind of questioned Christ. And she talked about the consequences, how it impacted her as well. You know, when you look at this, would you say that she was intimidated by his power, and by his identity? Now, that didn't mean that she didn't hold him in awe and respect and fear in that honorable kind of way, but she wasn't intimidated by that. And I think that is because she was a friend, because she was a friend. So that illustrated her true conviction, how convicted she really was to Jesus Christ. And so we have these amazing characteristics of friendship where we have this confidence and trust and faith. Boy, that's remarkable things, that that trust is exhibited by her actions and by her words. And so what a testimony to the friendship between the two of them. Of course, the story doesn't end there. It goes on. Uh, we're four days into the death, which is kind of significant by, its, by itself because oftentimes, especially at this time, it was almost like a, like a visitation you might have today or what they used to call a wake, uh, depending what area of the country you're from, hoping that somebody might awake from death well, traditionally, by the time you got to four days, forget it, it's over. There's no, no way this guy's coming back to life. So the four days seem to be significant uh, in that sense, that there's no hope that we got this wrong. He's really dead. And then, of course, we have Christ uh, weeping. Um, doesn't seem to be weeping over the death of Lazarus. He knew he was going to resurrect him. So that doesn't be, seem to be the reason that he's weeping. But, but certainly we get, in, get insight into Christ's humanity, the human side of Christ here. Uh, certainly being able to experience the whole range of emotions. You can imagine the scene with the ladies around that are wailing and crying and sobbing and truly uh, affected by, by Lazarus' death. Uh, boy, that can sure trigger a lot of emotions. In fact, it, it says here, uh, let's see, down in, what is it, verse 35, where he groaned or he was deeply moved or troubled. Um, there, are, there almost seems, if, if you would look that uh, section up, that, that there's a little bit of anger involved in this emotion that he's displaying here. And I got to thinking about that. What, why would Christ be angry if, if that's really what this groaning or being deeply troubled or disturbed was about? Uh, yeah, he cries. He seems to have that connection with the human emotion of those that have experiencing a loss, but it also seems maybe that this, this little bit of being perturbed or angry um, maybe has a connection to just life itself and humanity itself uh, because we are sinners. We are sinners, and Christ has had just about enough of sin. You know, he's going to take care of that uh, as he establishes his kingdom, and ultimately sin is going to be done away. And so maybe that's a little bit the, 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 the destruction and uh, problems that sin caused is certainly something to be angry about. So maybe that, that has something to do with some of his reaction here. But ultimately, uh, we find that he resurrects Lazarus and we have this, this wonderful, amazing miracle uh, that transpires. We're going to kind of skip over that story. And with a little bit of time left, we're going to go to a third story. 
Uh, this particular story is the anointing, is what I'll call it. And I don't know if anointing has one or two ends, but I put two just in case. Probably has one, right? All right, the anointing. Actually, now that I look at it, it probably does have one. <laughs> All right. The anointing. Let's, let's look a little bit further here in the book of John. So we're going to stay here. Just going to fast forward a little bit over to chapter 12. Chapter 12 bumps us up to the time that we're just before the crucifixion. We're just about a week out or so. Beginning chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus, who had been dead, uh, whom he had raised from the dead. So here we are back in the same town. Uh, there they made him a supper. And guess what? Of course, Martha served. Yeah, she's bound to do that, no doubt. But it says Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. So Lazarus is eating with Christ, Martha serving, taking care of everybody. What happened to Mary? Well, here comes Mary on the scene. Verse 3, Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And it says the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you will have with you always, but me you do not have always. And so we find a little bit more insight in what it means to be a friend of God. Now here we are, and, and it is kind of interesting here, back at uh, the house in Bethany. Uh, if we were to look up this home in Matthew or the book of Mark, it actually talks about uh, Simon the leper's house, which kind of takes us back, well, who is Simon the leper? It doesn't really tell us in the Bible who this is. Um, here in John, it talks about Martha's house, um, is it possible Martha's helping at Simon's house and that's what it's about? That doesn't seem to make sense. Uh, is it possible that this Simon, sometimes they, they translate the word leper, not only for leper, but it, it's also very closely connected to the word for being devout. So it could be Simon the devout. Well, would that be possible that maybe that's their father? Some of the scholars kind of go round and round about that sort of thing, that maybe as a man who was wealthy, left his home uh, when he died to his children, who then were also wealthy because of that. So uh, very possible. Even some will speculate that maybe the, the home was donated as a part of the community to help those uh, who were afflicted. So all of that kind of ties together. Well, with that, it kind of gives us some insight into, well, where would Mary come up with this expensive perfume? We're talking about uh, this this oil of spikenard that would have cost a year's worth of wages. And yet, she used it to anoint Jesus' feet. Well, kind of an interesting scenario. But it does, I think, give us insight into friendship. Uh, let's see, where are we? I guess these were some of the points in that regard. What does this point to? I think what it's saying here is friendship costs something. Friendship is costly. It costs us to be a friend of God. But is that something that's going to hurt us? <laughs> or is that something that's a good expense? You see, in Mary's case, uh, she was so humble. She was convicted. She was dedicated to Christ. She was dedicated to his teachings. She understood the gospel message. She understood stood why she was born. She understood all those things. So it came down to the fact that there wasn't any expense. There wasn't any cost that was too much for her to exhibit the fact that Christ was her friend. That Christ not only was her savior, not only her king and her master and, you know, her coming king, there was nothing that was too demanding for her to honor her friend. 
to honor the Savior. And as you read through the story, it, it doesn't say, well, she had this really expensive oil that, that was a year's worth of wages and its cost, and so she took a drop and put it on his feet. You know, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say, well, she poured out half of it and stuck the rest on the shelf or other thing. No, it doesn't say that. It says she poured it out. She gave it all. She gave it all. She spent it all. All that she had in that sense. All the oil was poured out for her Savior. And I can't help reading that and wonder about my stingy heart. You know, how much do I hold back? You know, what is it that I am not really willing to give? And so here she just set such an amazing example. And, and then as I think about those things, my, my mind starts to wander a little bit. Can you imagine? We're just a couple days before the crucifixion. And this, this uh, oil is uh, just really fragrant. And by the time they got to the crucifixion, I wonder if Christ could still smell that oil. You know, as he is agonizing through the torture that he had to go through, if that fragrance was still there, would that have reminded him of this relationship he had to a dear friend? Could that have maybe even helped him through the whole thing? I don't know, I'm kind of speculating there. But it's just interesting to think about, you know, that the action of this, this one woman maybe had an amazing impact. Maybe it was even prophetic that she fulfilled this. You know, did it, did it comfort him? I, I have a feeling it, it certainly did. I think it did. And as you think about that, what a wonderful example of our Savior, too. You see, because when we do things that honor God, we don't always get the pat on the back and people say, wow, that was great. You're doing a good job. This is wonderful. That's amazing. You're such a servant. Eh, you don't get that. A lot of times it's like, yeah, what's wrong with you? You've got other motives. You're not doing this right. And you get criticized, and you get put down, and you get condemned for when you're doing something for the right reasons. And I think this is a great example of this friendship that was between the two of them. Christ defended her. He defended her and said, leave her alone. Leave her alone. She's doing what's good. She's doing what's right. So Christ defends her. He vindicated her. And so for us, I think we can say, wow, when we're put down and we're criticized for doing something that God wants us to do, remember Mary. Remember her, because I think this is such a, a wonderful example of what is good and what is right and, and something that reminds us of, of what true friends do for each other. True friends do stick up for each other when they're doing what's right. True friends absolutely do that because this points to the kind of relationship that, that they had and the kind of relationship then that we need to have. We need to have a close relationship. We need to have that kind of an intimacy, that kind of closeness with our Savior and with God the Father as well. That's, that's the goal. That's the kind of friendship we want to attain to. And so as you, you look at these several stories, whether it was Jesus' visit, the resurrection of Lazarus, the anointing here that we go to, I think in a way it almost summarizes uh, all the Bible studies that we've had uh, on this particular topic about being a friend of God. Because here these stories certainly point to the fact that we share something in common as friends. We share something in common. We do with God the Father and Jesus Christ. We share our values. And of course, that's because we change to make God's values our values. God's concerns become our concerns, don't they? Don't God's directions, His ideas, His concepts, uh, the way that He looks at the world, that, that should be you know, our worldview. That should be our perspective. Uh, I mean, just think about the good friends you have right now. You know, the friends around us. Don't we hold things in common? Don't we have those kind of connections? If we're going to have a, a relationship that really grows and really thrives, boy, we need that. We need that kind of thing. And so here Christ certainly had that with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and he wants to have that with us. And so I think that's, that's an important aspect, this 
this whole aspect of sharing, that friends share those common values. They share the concerns and the ideals. Uh, but it certainly doesn't stop there. I mean, we know that friends influence each other. And humanly speaking, we can do that for the good. Uh, we can do it for the bad. But ultimately, part of what we find in, in this scenario is that that influence can be a, a really good thing, especially in the sense that the way that Christ and Martha especially uh, talked, that through discussion, that uh, through talking things out, and yeah, sometimes disagreement. You see, even though Martha disagreed with the fact Christ didn't show up, didn't hold it against him once she understood. Once she understood, well, it actually brought them that much closer together. So friends can have disagreements, but they can resolve it and be that much closer and through discussion. And sometimes it's got to be blatant. It's got to be bold. It's got to be direct. And yet, when we do that, we have a great influence upon each other. And of course, that's the kind of thing we can do when we pray to God, when we have issues and we want to be direct with God. He says, come boldly before the throne of grace. I love it that it says the throne of grace, <laughs> right? We can come boldly before. Well, do that. Be, be like a Martha and come boldly before God. Demonstrate your friendship. Demonstrate and submit to his influence in our life. That really begins to show what a great friend that we are, because we already know on God's side, I think he already is a great friend. And so friends do that sort of thing. Friends also respect each other. There's a love and a, and a respect and, and certainly an accountability that we hold to each other. That has to be there. This, this acceptance of each other, not accepting of sin, but accepting our personalities, that we're all different. And yet, we respect each other. I mean, God loves us, and you know what? He didn't make us all yellow pencils. We're all different. And that can be a very good thing when we ultimately respect Him. And so, yeah, we've got to have that influence in our life as well. I think the other thing is, that kind of ties in with this influence, is, is when times are tough, uh, we can count on each other. We can count on each other when times are tough. That's certainly the example we see uh, with uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus' death. We can count on each other for support. When things are tough, when there's a time of crisis, when we need support, uh, we know where to turn. Uh, when things get emotional, uh, when things are difficult, we can depend on God, and we, we know that he's going to be that kind of a, kind of a friend uh, to us. And so certainly the, the stories of Mary and Martha and Lazarus bring out that point. And maybe if we were going to, to sum all of these things up, I think we could probably, maybe one word would do it. This whole concept of, of trust. Trust is a great word because it, it is closely tied into that word for faith, that we have a confidence. We have a confidence in God as his friend, uh, not just his children, but as his friends as well. Remember what Christ told the disciples, you know, that, that yes, we can be friends and we can be intimate, and we can be close, and we're, we're brothers with him. We're brothers, and God is our Father. And so this friendship we see that we can have is, is a friendship that is a relationship of trust, a relationship of confidence, and a relationship of being close. And of course, then what we've got to do is take that same friendship and we've got to spread it around. We've got to be known as people who live by that standard. And as a, a collective group, as the church of God, this should be one of the evident things, one of the things that stand out about us. You know, so here we are in Cincinnati. We should be known for our friendship for how we mirror the kind of friendship that God extends to us, the kind of friendship that Jesus lived. And we should pray about that and ask God to help and guide and inspire us to be that kind of a friend. And I think if we, we do that, th then ultimately we can, we can be like an Abraham 
and truly be known as a friend of God. All right, well, that's going to do it for our study tonight. In fact, that uh, kind of concludes our series. Uh, we've got a couple of special Bible studies coming up. There will not be a study in two weeks from tonight. So our next study we're scheduled for is September 17th. So we'll probably have some uh, additional information that we'll post on the web about that particular Bible study and uh, what's to follow after that, okay? So enjoy your evening. Thanks for coming out tonight, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.